On this episode of the Sports Opinions Podcast, we go baseball heavy with former big league pitcher Steve Schrank, coached also in the big leagues, and now is the owner of Pitching Coach Pro, trains college pro and high school pitchers. Um, we talk Philadelphia Phillies, a team that he was associated with as a coach for 16 years, pitched for them, all things Phillies, how they're going to do, how their rotation, how their pitching is. We then broaden it out to pitching and baseball in general how he feels uh, the status is, what it's going to morph into, what it is. And then we talk about baseball recovering from COVID in terms of getting fans back and keeping fans, keeping people interested. So if you're a baseball guy, this is a great show. He drops a ton of knowledge. So I definitely recommend it. If you're a Philly fan, you'll like it as well. So everyone, I really hope you enjoy it. Now on to the show. What's up, sports fans, and welcome to the Sports Opinions Podcast. I am your host, as always, Alex Cuesta. And with me today is a man that spent 16 years in pro pitching as an MLB pitcher and also 16 years as a coach with the Philadelphia Phillies. And me being a Yankees fan, it's okay because I'm not a Mets fan, so it's okay that he was with the Phillies. He now owns Pitching Coach Pro, where he trains pro athletes, collegiate athletes, and develops high school pitchers. He is Steve Schrank. Steve, how are you, buddy? Doing great. Uh, Good to be here tonight. I really appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Absolutely. So talk about Pitching Coach Pro because there's a lot of places that kids are told now, especially younger kids in AAU and pitching year-round, go here if you want to get an advantage, if you're ready, if you want to go to the next level. You've done it. You've uh, managed at a few different levels. You were a pitching coach for years with the Phillies under uh, Charlie Manuel. What sets Pitching Coach Pro apart? What do you guys do there? Um, what's your goals in terms of developing people at different levels there? Um, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head a little bit there as far as like, you know, developing kids at different levels. Um, everybody has their level of work, kind of their expectations and their aspirations of where they want to go. Um, I have some, a uh, couple college guys. I have some pro guys. We have a lot of high school kids. Um, we do some younger clinics as well when we can just to kind of give back to the, um, to the community and work with some younger pitchers. Um, a lot of people pitching has become, uh, you know, kind of a, it's a, it's a talent to do it, but it's also a specialty. So you have to, there's a lot of hitting coaches, Alex, <laughs> everybody thinks they're a hitting coach. So, um, you know, when we get the pitching stuff in there, I think it's good. And it's be able to teach guys how to throw with all the injuries and with all the stuff that we've had, you know, over the years, these past past few years with the guys playing a lot of baseball is um, trying to teach them, you know, good, solid deliveries at a young age, uh, good arm actions, show them the game, teach them the game. And then in, along the way, um, teach them the analytics that are coming into the game as well. Um, I love that part of it too. Um, I have a rap Soto. I use it. I use a lot of the high speed video. Um, so a lot of these guys are getting stuff obviously that I never even had a chance to, to do when I was in high school. I mean, I remember warming up on the, on the, on the grass with no mounds, uh, back in 1987, <laughs> just to get ready for a game. And it, it is what it is, but these guys have a lot of advantages now with the PBR events, all the, the information going out there. Um, so that's kind of what we do at pitching coach pro, but I take a personal approach with it. Um, I don't try to clone anybody or make anybody do a certain thing. I take each individual pitcher to make them the best they can be. Um, the best version of them, I guess it would be the word that I would use for it. Um, so they're able to, uh, achieve all their goals. I think uh, a lot of it has to do with, you know, whatever level they want to get to, whether it's playing in little league, playing on an all-star team, playing in, in college, playing in high school. I think everybody has their level. And uh, obviously a lot of these kids now, you know, they see a lot of, you know, big league ball players on TV. They want to, that's kind of their goals as well. So it's a dream for a lot of guys. And I think we're kind of helping uh, a lot of kids get that and also go to school and pay for their education, which is a big part of my program right now. Um, You know, a lot of colleges will give out the academic and the athletic scholarships and you know, as well as I do, Mm -hmm. college is expensive. Um, so a lot of the parents and the kids really want to invest in it. And it's a small investment to make now for, for a big and bright future. Definitely. So where are you located? Um, do you have multiple locations or where are you located where you do uh, your clinics and your training and stuff? 
Well, right now I've, I've been kind of uh, across the, the states a little bit with it. I've been out to Oregon. I've been to Ohio. I've been to uh, North Carolina. I've been to Florida. And now I'm we're up here in Lehigh Valley, the Bethlehem area. Mm-hmm. Pretty close to New York, obviously, um, but it's a very nice area. I love the Northeast. Northeast baseball is awesome. There's just Northeast baseball has always been good. Uh, no matter what level you're looking at, people just love their baseball here. All the years I played here, it was just a, it's just a haven for for baseball. So um, we're here in this area, and then we're I work out of Philly, out of a, out of a facility um, called um, On Deck, and I work out of another facility here in, in Bethlehem, the Hitter's Edge. Okay. And then we travel around different facilities. I don't have my own facility. Um, I just really enjoy going into other people's places and being able to work with their teams and their kids. And um, to be quite honest, that's uh, that's a big haul right there in itself. So um, I really enjoy that. And it's nice going into some of these new state-of-the-art facilities that are pretty cool. Awesome. So do you get giddy when you have a high school lefty that can throw mid to low 80s in control with a fastball? Like, Is that something that you look at and you're like, I kind of have a gem here, a lefty that can do that. They're diamonds in the rough. <laughs> yeah, especially a left-hander. And if I do have one, I'm sending them right to the Philly right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, send them. I know you're a Phillies guy. Send them I know. Yeah, I know. You want to go to the Yankees. Send them to my Yankees. <laughs> but um, that's a perfect transition. Let's go to your Phillies because you spent a long time you pitched for the Phillies, you stayed in the organization and coached there um, under some of their better teams that were there Mm -hmm. with the Philadelphia Phillies. Were you there for the championship? Yeah, I was there in 08. I was in um, Clearwater. um, Okay. Wow. That that season. And then in 09, I went to double A. So yeah, I've gotten to work with, you know, Cole Hamels and Hoskins and I played with Jimmy Rollins and I coached Utley a little bit and Howard coached him and, um, some of the guys that were on that team, Joe Blanton, I did a lot of the rehabs when they came down and stuff. I got a chance to work with Pedro. I mean, obviously the late Royal holiday and spring training um, and, you know, Oswald and Blanton. And, you know, it was just, it was pretty cool to see that. And Cliff Lee was another one. I mean, we had some, we had some studs. I mean, and there's a reason why we won. Um, yeah. But I mean, it's like, uh, you know, just being able to be around those guys and, and being a part of that, you know, Rich Doobie was the pitching coach, obviously Charlie Manuel, who's one of my favorites and, and still one of Philly's favorites is, was the manager. So it was just, it was just nice being around those guys and talking baseball. But at the same time, it was just the winning atmosphere in Philly and that the Philly family that we had there was pretty amazing at, at that time. Yeah, absolutely. That was just an amazing run of a team that they had there where they were just always competitive. Now with this current team, you're a pitching guy. Um, let's start off looking at their starting rotation that they have going right now. You have Nola Wheeler and I think Eflin are kind of a lock, Mm -hmm. Um, but there's definitely going to be a battle down there. Matt Moore, Chase Anderson, I think have the lead over there, but Vince Velasquez is a young kid that can definitely threaten. And you also have Spencer Howard who might come up, come down. He's another one on the outskirts. Who do you think ends up being their starting five? And are they good enough to compete right now? with that starting five or should they kind of already be looking to make a move? Um, I think with the top of the rotation there with Nola and Wheeler, you have two guys that are going to give you a chance every night um, and kind of get things back in order. If one of the other guys do slip. Um, I like having Matt Moore. I think having that lefty in that Philadelphia rotation is, has been needed. Um, and it's, you know, we've been trying even the years I was there to develop one of those lefties and get them there. We've had a few guys along the way. Some of them have pan out to be relievers, pretty good ones. But I think it's um, – I like more. I like Anderson. Um, I personally like Velasquez in the bullpen. That's just my opinion. But I think uh, I think he's got the stuff to, to be a back end of the bullpen kind of a guy with the stuff that he does and let it, let it, let it rip a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think what they have, it's pretty good. It's a good start. I mean, we'll see what happens. You know, health is a big thing. Um, yeah, the nice thing about Wheeler and Nola and Zach, they kind of proved that last year, that they could give you some innings. Um, you know, Maddie can give you some minutes. I've seen more do that a little bit and a little bit with Anderson, but I think that's the biggest thing is being able to get, you know, a little deeper in games. Um, and I think they'll have an opportunity to do that with Girardi. I think Girardi has that mentality a little bit. Um, and then to really get deeper into games and give them a chance and, uh, and save that bullpen for when you really need it, because there's going to be nights when you get in trouble when you need it. But I think having those, oh, yeah. the bullpen has been revamped. Um, quite a bit this year. They have some arms. They have some velocity out there. I think for the first time they have three or four or five guys throwing over 95 miles an hour, which is huge. I mean, yeah. that makes up for some of the mistakes that you make when you make bad pitches. Um, but I think that it's, the rotation is solid. I like it. Like I said, I'm, I'm real happy with that. With more, more can really contribute this year. 
and win 10 or 11 games, that's going to be a, that's going to be a huge boost for the organization. But not only that, you just, you have, you, you throw that lefty in the mix. That's a big thing. How different is it going to be for these starters, whoever ends up being the five, especially the top end guys that they have a legitimate spring training now that it's not the funky style that we had when we were at the height of COVID. Um, we knew it was looming. We didn't know if the season was like, there was so much weird things going on last year. What is it going to do for these guys just to have a normal spring training this season? Uh, it's going to help them a lot. I think, you know, obviously they start, it started out normal last year. Yeah. I mean, they were all getting ready to go. And I talked to Nola and I talked to, to Adam Morgan and some other guys and they were all pumped and ready to go for the season. And then it shut down. That's hard on a mentally it's hard, but also physically to kind of stop and start. Mm -hmm. And they were able to do some stuff, um, throw a little bit, but it's not the same as pitching in, you know, major league baseball games. Um, you can throw simulated VP and do all that stuff you want to do, but there's nothing, there's, there's nothing better than the experience of pitching in a game and getting that experience. And, um, I think it's going to be good. Like I said, I expect pretty good things from the team. Everything was, they were really excited going in, I think last year. Um, and I think having, having Joe uh, on the, on board as well. So, um, you know, he has a track record of his own and you can tell by the way he runs a clubhouse and the way he's done things and any one and over in New York. And yep. um, I know a lot of the coaches, I know Dusty Wathen, I know David Lundquist, they're all excited about it. I've talked to him. So there's some good things that are going to come out of it. And like I said, I expect some pretty good things. I mean, Again, you look at the NL East, it's, it's going to be a, you know, it's going to be a fight. That's pretty good yeah. baseball. It's a pretty good division right there up and down. So um, the best will, you know, the best, I think the, the team that stays healthy and is consistent as far as um, being able to get that pitching and go deep in ball games, I think mm -hmm. is that you're going to come out on top. I really do. Definitely. So when you're looking at the pen, you have guys like Archie Bradley, Hector Neris, um, Alvarado, Brogdon, you mentioned Velasquez, who's probably, if he doesn't win the starting spot, going to have a spot in the pen. And you have guys that they um, got over in trades in, Sam Coonrod, Hector Rendon, that are on the outskirts right now looking in and need to have a good spring in order to get in. David Hale doesn't have an option left to go back down, so he really needs to pitch well. Who are you excited to see in the pen that you think can kind of make a jump this year to be, you know, give them more stability in the pen? Um, you know, I, I coached Connor Brogdon for a couple of years and his name comes up a lot now. And I know that they really like him a lot. And the nice thing about Connor is that he's got pitches that he can face righties and lefties. So it's like having a lefty out there. His changeup is devastating. I look at his changeup like, uh, and, and I'll say this cautiously, but pretty close, like a left-handed changeup. He's got a right-handed changeup like Cole Hamels had a left-handed changeup. It was a, it's a good changeup. It's nasty. So, I mean, it's got some good movement on it. I mean, you have to, you, you, it's even tough to sit on. I've seen guys struggle with it. And then he throws, you know, mid nineties, if not plus at times behind that changeup. So you're looking at a pretty good pitch. Um, I think um, Hector can get into a role where there's not so much pressure on him and be able to pitch as a setup guy. And I think it's perfect for him. I think that was a little bit too much for him at times. Uh, I had Hector over the years. Um, he has his stuff. He knows how to pitch. His split fingers nasty. Uh, again, there's no room for mistakes because he doesn't have that upper 90s fastball. So when he does make a mistake, you know, guys can hit it. I mean, they're doing a good job with it. <laughs> you know, they hit plus 90 now. <laughs> it uh, doesn't take long to do that. So, um, and then they had the Coonrod kid I, who I coached in um, Arizona Fall League two, two or three years ago, power arm. Um, again, I think some of his stuff's been a little bit of command issues, but he has his stuff. Um, I've seen him throw. And then the kid, the left-hander they picked up, I think uh, – the Latin kid, what was his name? Alvarado, is it? Oh, you oh, they have um, a few guys. That Ranger, oh no, yeah, Jose Alvarado, yeah. Alvarado, yeah. 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 Um, he's, They're expecting like he's, things out of Alvarado, yep. And he's got some uh, a lot of experience too, so that, that yeah. helps a ton. So, and then you got Ranger Suarez, who missed a lot of last year because he had the COVID and he wasn't feeling good. But there's a guy that the year before had a great year. Yep. And I know Ranger. Ranger can pitch. He throws strikes. He's a competitor and it's another lefty. So the depth is a lot better now. As far and now you've had some depth, depth, and a little bit of experience because they got to play some last year. Mm -hmm. I'm glad they got to play some baseball because those guys needed that experience, like the JoJo Romero's or Connor Brogdon. So they did get some um, going into a big year where the Phillies, in my opinion, are expected to win with a team they put together. You know who who but Joe Girardi goes into another situation where he has some good problems in the pen. The same thing he had with the Yankees. Another situation where there's good problems to have where you have a lot mm -hmm. of live arms that you you know guys that can potentially be horses for you in there 
and you have kids that you can call up in AAA when everything opens up that you know can take some of the um, pressure off these other guys. So Joe Girardi has a good situation there. So you talked about how stacked the NL East is. Um, the Marlins shocked everyone last year, and they're yeah. an upstart. They're scrappy. The Mets, once again, are projected to be very good. We'll see if the injury bug hits them. Mm-hmm. The Braves have been good. This just a loaded, loaded division right now. Um, with I, I'd say the NL East has the most potential at a division where, you know, I guess the Braves are the only true proven, proven club right now to be a real threat, but everyone else kind of has a potential to be really good. Yeah. Um, where do you see the Phillies fair right now in that? Um, I mean, and like I said, it, like I said, it's going to depend on how they're doing with, you know, if they stay healthy, I mean, that's always the big thing every year. Yeah. They've had some injury bugs along the way. I think if they stay healthy, they're, they're competing. I mean, I really do. Um, I look at, you know, the, the Mets, like you said, um, we'll see how they, how they play out. They, on paper, it looks pretty good. Um, we'll see how the team gels. Um, yep. I think the, the Phillies now have a team that's been playing together for a little bit. We've added some pieces, yeah. Uh, but I still think they have a chance to. Um, the pieces that they've added have been good. I think they're older veteran guys. Look at Matt Joyce, for instance. I mean, he's going off in spring training right now, but he's a guy that's been there, done that. I mean, he's going to lead that clubhouse. Um, yeah, definitely. And take some of the pressure off. Maybe a Reese. You know, Bryce can go play. Um, yeah. Maybe some of the older guys that maybe aren't as good players. They're good. They're good in the clubhouse, and they're good to fill in when they need to, and come up with a big pinch hit or a big at bat, and it helps out a clubhouse. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, but uh, Braves are going to be good. I mean, yeah. they got pitching, and they hit. They hit the ball. Mm-hmm. I mean, so gosh, I don't know. I like to see say they get in for a wild card. I mean, you always hope they win the division. Uh, but again, the Marlins snuck in there. I mean, it just there's just so many wild cards. It's going to be interesting. There's. Would the wild card come out of the NL East? Um, I think too. So I don't. I don't. I didn't quite see how they're doing it this year with the playoffs. Did they add him or give everybody a chance like it was the same last year? Or is it a little bit different? Um. I see. I got to look at the rules again because I know. Like I said I don't know. They might. I don't know if they're doing another grace period and keeping it that and experimenting. But yeah, God knows what the MLB is doing from year to year at this point anymore. <laughs> yeah. Like. It's just such a mystery, but um, yeah, that division you're gonna need ninety plus at minimum, nine, almost ninety five wins. I think you're gonna need you're gonna need that over division. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's it's a real tough division to win. Now, let's go a little bit broader than just the NL East. Let's talk about baseball in general. Um, you pitched in the league. Uh, how has it really changed? We could talk about you know you mentioned sabermetrics and the analytics that are old school guy can complain about it all they want but it's there um how do you feel about the way it's changed do you kind of agree with a lot of the sabermetrics and what they're doing um just give me your opinion on how pitching in baseball currently is especially compared to when you were doing it um it, our, our, the lingo is different the, the, the end result is still there we're still looking for guys that throw hard guys that can spin the baseball guys that can pitch up in the zone guys that can have command guys that can you know um you know, different things. It's just a lingo. A 12 to six curveball now is, is, you know, it's got good spin. It's a 3000 spin rate with a good vertical break. And it's a little bit of horizontal. So, I mean, it's the, it's just the, how we're saying it now a little bit, the lingo has changed. Um, but if you talk to an old, you know, someone has been around and they get a, if you don't understand it, it gets a little bit hard. It's, it's like, okay, what is he talking about? Spin rate. You know, it took me a little bit too to understand it. Um, but I think it, it works. Um, obviously you, you look at numbers. Numbers have always been in baseball. We have numbers that tell you how good you are, how much money you make. Uh, it's mm-hmm. the same thing. Um, now they're different. They're, they're using different numbers, and I think it's sometimes to an advantage of a guy. If he doesn't if he only hits 270, 260 now, which is pretty good average. Um, they look at WAR. They look at how many runs he drove in, or or what his um, exit velocity is, or there's different things they look at, and then how they judge and how they pay guys too. So. It can be good and bad, um, but I think the, for the most part, I think if we work together and, and we started to a little bit with Philly, it was rough at first. I think we went a little bit hard analytic and kind of forgot everything else, and now we're going back to where they are a little bit with Joe Girardi and stuff, going back to, the, to, the, to that part of it. Um, and Because it, it, it takes both. It takes scouting. It takes player development. It takes everything. And I've said this before. I can't put a number on heart and soul. And what a guy has between his ears. You can't. And you can't tell if he's going to be a good clubhouse guy, if he's going to interact with the team, is he going to get along with the manager? 
what's he going to do when the bases are loaded in the World Series game six? And is yeah. he going to, you know, yeah, he has the stuff, yeah. but does he have does he have the mental fortitude and the mindset to be able to get out of it, even if he doesn't have the stuff? Because we know, as well as anybody knows, you don't have it every day. Let's say you have 30 starts. There's probably a good 10 where you're just terrible, awful. And there's not much you can do about it except compete and give your team a chance. Well, that's where the heart and soul for me come into because you still have to go out there and pitch. No one's, you know, you can't say, oh, I just don't feel good today. And I'm first inning, I'm out. You know, <laughs> it happens. You get knocked out of the first inning, but you got to give your team a chance. Um, you need to build the innings up because you got four more games coming right after that. I think that's the biggest thing is when those blowouts happen or where you get beat up, you have to like give your team a chance to stay in that game, pitch that game. So the next night we can use the good guys when we are winning. Um, Definitely. Yeah. But I think that the analytic part is, is good. I, I love all the data. I, I'm not opposed to it yet. I love it. I think that once you understand it, it's just like we talked a long time ago about stuff. Um, how a guy's release side is, how his release side is. It's just putting a number on all that stuff instead of, actually saying he's a low three quarter or a high three quarter. Um, it's just putting a number on it. And it's good for, for kids nowadays because they're in the video games. They're, they're used to this stuff. They're on their phone. So a lot of them adapt to it. Um, some guys don't like it. And we, I, as far as I'm concerned, if you don't like it, I don't think we should force it. I think it's something that, you know, here's the information. If you want it, here it is. Um, use it to your advantage. And eventually guys start drawing on it. Um, I personally – don't I'm not a big fan of shifts, but they are what they are. I mean, I think if you have really good ball players defensively, you don't have to shift so much. Um, and they make good plays and they have range. Um, I think when you don't have the range and they're not very good defensively, you have to shift a little bit more to get put them in a better position for that guy that's hitting. So um, that's just that's my opinion on it. But I'm glad to have that now after all these years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with you with the shift. I can't see guys like Cal Ripken or. Derek Jeter allowing someone to walk onto their side of second base and be okay with it. Yeah. I could just see him sitting there and be like, mm, no, I can get anything from here from third. And I, yeah. Second. Like you're not, you're not putting another guy in my area. Yeah. yeah. Please second, get him out of here. Like, and, I, and I can handle it. Yeah. And yeah. I'll cover this and I'll cover that. Yeah. Yeah. But um, you know, one of the biggest criticisms and I, you know, I like the way you break down the sabermetrics there and talking about, it's just like, you know, a different lingo. And we have heard all those things, you know, the high three quarters, the submarine pitcher, which mm -hmm. we don't see much of anymore, but you know, you kind of have those things. Uh, one of the biggest criticisms I hear of sabermetrics and the analytics is the hundred pitch count being a pretty ironclad number where a lot of guys, once that clicks on, it's like, all right, if he's has a, if he struggles, he's out after this or this inning, you know, or going through a third time in the rotation where you see guys that are dominating through two times through the rotation and just looking like they're going to be horses. And then sixth inning comes and the manager walks out after the, you know, mm -hmm. it's, some things I think just drive guys, you know, like me that I've watched baseball and now I'm 32. I've been watching baseball for a long time and I've seen that shift from, old school baseball to this analytics side. And it does drive me crazy every once in a while where I see a guy who's supposed to be our horse and then middle of the six comes, gets through the ninth guy, struggles on that for that, that leadoff guy again, he's out. Like that kind yeah. of drives me crazy. How do you feel about that? Is it that kind of analytics gone a little too far sometimes where you're not kind of trusting your guys to finish those types of games? Um, I think that, uh, you know, the hundred pitch thing, we did it in the minor leagues for a long time. Um, and it was mainly to save arms. It was mm -hmm. mainly to get guys prepared for the big leagues. But at the same time, it was for to protect them, to let them not throw so much because at the end of the day, you want big leaguers. You don't want to blow guys out in the minor leagues. Um, that was kind of what it was for. The number now has kind of evolved a little bit in the big leagues. Um, yeah, I think you can get a little bit, you can train guys to say at 100 pitches, mentally, I'm done. Or, or you have guys that, like I said here, I'll go back to it again, the heart and soul of, of what a guy was going to do. Uh, there was some guys you weren't going to take out of the game. You weren't taking Kurt Schilling out of the game. Terry Francona wasn't taking Kurt Schilling out of the game. I mean, as much as Tito wanted to, I know there was times like he, he if I go out there, he's not going to give me the ball. You know what I mean? So that's a little bit old school. I mean, we're going back a little bit, but I think that mentality is what you want from those guys is to say, I can do this now. We see the numbers on the on the on the track man, the rap soto. So you can kind of follow if they're losing a little bit. But there again, 
if the heart and soul is there and they have the fight and they have the grind to do it, I think it's okay. Now you have fresh arms out in the bullpen. So, but it's, you know, like you said, you're taking a gamble. Is he good tonight? Is, uh, is Neris going to be good tonight? Well, you don't know until he gets in the game, but you do know what you have in front of you. <laughs> so, so a little, a little question with inside baseball, since you've been in it, you've watched it, you've coached it. Um, at the higher level, when you're working with some starters, are you coaching them as if you have a guy like right now, we have, you know, and the Yankees, I have Luis Severino who mm -hmm. absolute cannon in the high nineties. Yeah. Are you kind of coaching that guy up though, when it hits the sixth, seventh, if we need you and your fastball is now hitting 96 instead to learn how to pitch through that. Cause I feel like some guys now we have some starters who just come and they throw fire. And then when their arm starts to get tired, they don't know how to adjust. They don't have those secondary pitches that, they can rely on to really get them through a tough inning because your pen is a little bit um, exhausted and we need you to go six. Yeah. Is there a strategy there where you're kind of coaching a guy like, listen, when you feel your fastball going, when your movement's not hitting, start focusing here. Like I know a lot of it's mental, especially with pitchers. Mm -hmm. um, what is the coaching aspect there with the guy when you have a guy that just relies on heat to be his strength? Um, I think, you know, that, the, the fastball should always be everybody's strength unless you're a knuckleballer. So I think that has to be command is another thing. I think too, you have to be able to command the baseball like a Verlander who throws 95 hour a fastball down and away at the knees. Um, that's big. You, you can't make mistakes to big league hitters. If you throw it over the middle of the plate, if you watch sports center at the end of the night, anything middle, middle in is getting hit out of the park. It doesn't matter if it's 97 or 102. So you got to be able to pitch. I think also that being able to throw those pitches, like you said, you brought up a good point. Being able to throw breaking balls behind in the count. 2-0, 2-1, change-ups behind an account. Um, you can't be predictable, not in the big leagues. You just can't. You have to be able to throw those other pitches behind an account. And when you do that – Unless you're Mariano Rivera. The only unless you, and, you, and everybody knew it was coming. <laughs> and he, 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 <laughs> there's rare guys like Mo that you knew it was coming and you were not hitting it. <laughs> and have you ever seen his spray chart? He never threw a ball in the middle of the plate. No. All of his cutters were out and in. If you looked at his all of his pitches he ever threw, all the reds were there. And the rest of it was was almost black in the middle. So <laughs> that tells you right there, it was a nasty pitch, but he yeah. never threw it in the middle of the plate. And when he did, I'm sure that I'm almost certain it got hit. I mean, those guys hit those. But I think, like you said, I think I, I like to see more big league pitchers be 50 50 pitchers. 50% um, fastballs, 50% off speed. I think we have to now. The guys are hitting, they're hitting velocity. Um, it's not all about the velocity. I think you have to be a 50 50 pitcher, which means you got to throw a 50% off speed. 50% fastballs. Now, what does that do to your arm? That saves your arm to pitch later in the games because it's not as hard to throw those change-ups and breaking balls as it is a 90 mile, 98 mile an hour fastball. It's more stress on your arm. And I think that's another thing when you were talking about bringing up the innings. Um, I don't look at a guy when he's pitching in my aspect. I look at it, we, I would call it troubles. How many troubles did he get in during that game? Um, first inning, Gave up two runs through 25 pitches. Next inning, 10-pitch inning, easy inning. Okay, you got your 30. Now he maybe he threw a 30-pitch inning. So that's two troubles. Most of the time when you have those in a game for a guy, it's very stressful, high-stress innings. Mm -hmm. That's like throwing another inning. Add an inning on to every one of those stressful innings. Okay. So you get 25, 30. You got to add another inning because that's a tough inning. It's a, it's, you had to work extra hard to get some outs. Whether it was throw a lot of pitch or I have to throw, you know, come out of the bases loaded and really kind of like bear down and throw a little bit harder and do a little bit more. Um, that's why I like to look at it. And you, everybody talks about that game with Snell. <laughs> I don't think he had one trouble. <laughs> no, so, no. So, I mean, it's one of those things that everybody was upset about it, but you have to, at that point as a manager and, you know, everybody's got to make that decision and live with it. Um, how was he at that point? Is he better than anything else I have in the bullpen? I mean, does he have that look in his eye? Does he have it? And if you're okay with that, if he does it, it gets through it. But if he doesn't, you have to be able to say, you know what, he didn't do it, but I still knew in my heart that he could. I mean, yeah, the analytics are there on it, but that's where the fun of baseball is. That's where we can't take that part away from it. I think that's what makes baseball why everybody loves the game. Yeah. Because you get to make those decisions as a manager, and that's why I think managers like to manage. Besides being on the field, we get to do something. You get to be a part of something still. You get to make a decision. Definitely. So I've been critical. I do another show with my brother, which is more of a variety show um, called Quest of Dose. It's on this network, the Opinions Podcast Network. But I do a show with him, and I've been critical of the fact that in current baseball, 
I believe that there's very few starters left. You don't see guys, they've lowered the quality start number down. Um, you see less and less guys going six innings strong. You see a lot of guys coming out in the fifth. We have the starter now, um, the, the one inning starter, which I think is a cool concept. I'm okay with the one inning starter, but I, I, I'm more critical that starters have not been starters as much. They're more glorified long relievers. Tell me I'm, how I'm wrong there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, if you look I know at the I'm teams, wrong, but it's just how I feel about it. The I Rays did something. Alive. You know, I, I will say this the Rays got away with they, they have good pitchers. Yeah. Let's just forget about the fact what they did. They have really good pitching. They've mm-hmm. had good pitching. That's why they're winning how they're winning. They have a decent offense. It's a good offense. But their pitching is why they're winning. Their pitching their defense is really good. Um, and I don't think it mattered where you put them in a game. They were going to do well. They have the arms. Um, now, you know, it worked out in a shortened season. I like to see how it's going to work in a long season mm-hmm. for, a full, for a full season. But I, I can't say that you're wrong. I think that, like you said, it, it's, it's what we're doing as an industry a little bit is making – like you said, 100 pitches, um, you're done. And I think when you get around the 85, 90, you kind of see that a little bit. It's like it's almost like, okay, I'm done. My job is done tonight. Like I've done what I'm supposed to do. Let the bullpen cover the rest. Well, do pitchers know their pitch count when they go back into the pen. Do guys ask where am I at? Like, is that something? Because I know, like I said, like baseball is probably one of the biggest mental games as it is physical mm-hmm. more than anything else. Are there pitchers, starting pitchers, that go in and ask, "What's my number? Where am I at?" Or well, is that something that they kind of keep in their head themselves? It's on the scoreboard every night in the major league. It is. Oh, yeah, it yeah. is. Actually. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can see it right there. So, I mean, yeah, you have an idea. You know what innings you're in. But also, if you if you should be locked in enough where it doesn't matter. And I tell all my guys, pitch to pitch, one pitch at a time. I mean, win every pitch. Win every battle out there. Win every out. Mm-hmm. Um, when you start breaking the game down like that, you don't even remember what inning you're in sometimes. All you're doing is going to battle each time with that guy. Um, and I think that's what the good ones do. I think that the good ones do, and the ones that are making good money and doing a good job and they're worth paying are the ones that you're going to get. Now we have to decide how we're going to do this game. I'm hoping it gets back to it a little bit because that's what people like to watch baseball. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to lose fans. I really don't. I, I think that we've lost some. We've lost some to other sports, and it's a little frustrating. I think we need to get it back. I think um, I think they will. I, I hope. I think just, we need to get back to just playing the game and, and let, it, let it play out and, and – uh, I think, you know, doing the little things in the little in the game. I mean, yeah, home runs are nice, but, gosh, I can't stand to watch guys strike out every night. It's either a strikeout walk or a home run. Um, it's a little frustrating because if they do have a shift on, there's no reason why if you want to win the game, you wouldn't hit it to the other side of the infield. I, I mean, mean, you're speaking like a true National League guy for the most part. Um, yeah. and you kind of – you walked right into our next topic about – uh, we're in this pandemic. We're still in the pandemic right now, even though things are slowly loosening up. Texas just did their thing and said, let's mm-hmm. get it on. Um, but we're still dealing with COVID. The vaccines are getting out there. But, you know, as it goes on, hopefully we get better. Biggest mission of the MLB over the past, I want to say, decade is how are we going to get more uh, black players to come into the game? How are we going to attract more fans from the urban sector to come in and um, kind of like baseball and basketball and football, not just the other two that have definitely kind of had a big impact there. I feel like the shift needs to go now, like you said, to getting fans back, period. I don't mm-hmm. think they can kind of focus on anything. I think we, um, as baseball, they need to start focusing again back on the young fans, just period, because yeah. that's the future. A lot of guys, me, you, you know, we're going to go back and watch our baseball. I'm going to watch the Yankees, but there's people in high school that unless they're playing and people in middle school that unless they're playing, they're not going to want to watch it. They're rather go in, you know, watch the Nets versus the Lakers instead, yep. whoever's on there when football comes back. And even the new fan controlled football league is on Twitch and so many kids are on Twitch. So it's yeah. really easy to just click over and watch that. What do they need to do? Uh, you said to get back and play in the game. And I, even as a Yankees fan, I know my 96 and 98 Yankees are, really responsible for this love for the home run right now, big time, because they were one of the ones Cecil Fielder, um, you know, D- Daryl Strawberry was a great hitter, but he was a big home runner bus guy later in his career. Mm-hmm. And those teams were built of guys that hit home runs. Yes, they were clutch hitters, but they were a lot of home runs on those teams. Yeah. Yeah. And 
I do enjoy myself the small ball. I enjoy manufacturing runs. I think that's great baseball. Is it possible to get back there? Because as much as we love sabermetrics on the pitching side, on the hitting side, it says the home run is a really good thing. You know, yeah. on base percentage is not as important as getting that run in. So it's kind of a double edged sword. You said that they we need to kind of get back to baseball. That's going to be interesting. What do you think is going to happen with the designated hitter? Do you think that's going to come over to the NL for good? I feel like that's something they're talking about. Are we going to get our pitch clock? Is there going to be that man on second right away in the 10th inning? Are we going to kind of tangle with those things to kind of get these young fans back? I think, I think we probably will. And we did it a lot in the minor leagues when I was there. We did the pitch clock. Uh, didn't make a difference in the games. The games were still, if they cut out any time, I would be surprised. But you can step off. There's no, there's no penalty for um, the clock running out, except if you know, maybe a strike. But if you see the clock running out, you just step off. So it resets the clock. So just adds more time to it. Um, as far as a runner at second base, it was hard. <laughs> it was a little bit, you know, I didn't really like that at all. I didn't like that person. I think there, there's got to be – I don't know. Um, none of the stats count. It's just at that point, it's a win or loss. It's a win or lose. None of the stats count. I don't, I don't think any of the stats can count because if the guy's at second base, he never would have been there. So I have a hard time with that a little bit. I understand trying to shorten the game try to make it so it gets over and we can move on. I mean, everybody in life now is everybody's moving. They don't want to sit through a four or five hour game. I get it. Um, I think the only people I like are the concession people. <laughs> they're making and the money. owners, the owners are happy too, because the they, owners, they start reserving the beer part. after the ninth. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but for the most part to get the young people back, like you said, the NBA has done a good job with it. Yeah. They really have. Um, and I think we got to somehow follow some kind of a game plan there with it. I really do. Cause they've done a really good job with it. A lot of the young kids are, are doing it. Now, a lot of, like you said, if they're not playing baseball, they're not watching it, you know, and they're watching football and, you know, it was, I don't know. There's get some younger guys in the game. We're, they're doing a little bit better job of it, but I still think like you talked about the inner city kids, I think sometimes the sport can be a, um, it's, it's an expensive sport to play sometimes at the younger levels. Um, and I think that's unfair a lot to a lot of our kids and we miss out on a lot. Um, I know there's a lot of good programs out there that help out, but I think we need more. I really do. So we can get more athletes to come in and play because it's the, it's the one of the biggest reasons it, it is so expensive every weekend you go play. I mean, to play on some of these travel teams, it's, yeah. you know, 2,500, $3,000 for the year. And there's a lot of families that just can't afford that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I don't think being a minor league coach and a player, I couldn't afford my kids to play on that team. I just, I wouldn't have. I would have been like, we're going to play little league and I'm going to coach you up. I mean, mm -hmm. let's go get them. Let's play high school ball. But it's, it's changed a lot. I mean, in that way, but I think that's why they were trying to go with the analytic part of it. Cause it kind of met to the kids, the computer, the, all that stuff, the box on the TV, it's all cool stuff. It looks cool, but yeah. we have to figure out a way to get the young fans. So you're absolutely right. Can we unleash the personalities a little more? Cause I feel like the unwritten rules, I'm not a big fan of uh, unwritten rules. I love old school baseball, but at the same mm -hmm. time, Throw a better pitch. If you don't mm -hmm. want a guy flipping a bat, don't throw <laughs> it down. the. And the fact that you get to use that baseball that you throw 90 miles an hour as a weapon against somebody to me is insane. I know guys are, you know, you throw it in a safer spot. You try to at least, but you're still pegging somebody. It's the thing you're taught not to do as you grow up. And it still it, hurts. <laughs> it, it hurts. And yeah. for me, I look at that and I'm like, okay, why can't the hitter now run at him with the bat why is that not allowed like so for me i hate the unwritten rules aspect and i feel like you have you know you have bryce on the phillies you have uh fernando tatis you have guys that have personalities francisco yeah. Lindor. let these personalities shine why can't they just throw the bat halfway across the field if they hit a big bomb i get it yeah if nine one and you do it you're an idiot but if yeah. it's a hit that gets you the lead in the late eighth man you should be able to go nuts and you should be able to, you know, outside of taunting the guy directly, celebrate a little, go around the base yeah. pass. Like, spike you know, the football, spike the bat. It'd be kind of cool. See him yeah. spike the bat. <laughs> There's certain things that drive me nuts. Like he didn't run around the bases fast enough. Like what are you serious right now? Like, yeah, because <laughs> you yeah. have to watch him celebrate a little longer. Like there's certain things that drive me nuts around baseball. I feel like the younger generation gets driven nuts a little bit about that too, because we like to see, that emotion. I think everyone likes to see that emotion, but you do have some of these old school guys. It's like it's disrespectful to the game. And it's like the cork bat wasn't disrespectful 60 years ago. HGH <laughs> wasn't disrespectful. Like they pick and choose what disrespectful. And yeah, I feel like that would go a long way if we allow players 
to have personalities besides the pitchers. Chapman Gill used to get a, sh- a win and he would roll off the mound. And, yeah. and like, no one was trying to kill Ovaldis Chapman after the next game. He went out for uh, a save. It's like the two, the double standard is what drives me nuts. And I think that giving these guys the ability to have a personality would go a long way with the young group. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I agree with you. I think there's a personality should not be taken out of it. I think the celebrations are, they're getting a little bit more. Bryce has fun. He wears the, all the shoes and, the, and all he's that. He's willing of, to take cool. a ball to the back though. He doesn't care. He'll throw the back. He knows it's coming. He's willing to do it, to have a good time. <laughs> yeah. And I think at the end of the day, and I think if, if we remember this and I, and Ozzie Gian told me this, um, but Ozzie played, Ozzie was an entertainer. I love Ozzy. Ozzy said, Ozzy said it to all of us in the clubhouse when I was with the White Sox. You guys were entertainers. They're here to watch us and have fun and entertain. Have fun. Mm-hmm. And play. Give them balls. Do something goofy. Have fun with it. I mean, we're entertainers. Manny we're really playing a game, and I get it. We're playing a game. But at the same time, people are paying to be entertained. That's entertainment. It's, it's, uh, it's part of the game. And I think um, just like the basketball, all stuff they do, and they – Put some rules on basketball too. I've been watching it with my son lately. I'm like, what's a flagrant foul? He just ran into him. I said, how how does that happen? Not the to get clear, on basketball, but I'm like, the clear path foul drives me nuts yeah. too. But um, but yeah. But anyway, I, with the baseball, I think yeah. let you know Bryce and Tatis. Yeah, I think it's going to come around. I, I do. I think they're letting them do a little bit more. Wear the yeah, stuff yeah. they want to wear. Have fun with it. I think it's the only way you're going to get the younger generation back. And I think you're kind of seeing it now. In the in the area that I'm at, um, a lot of guys are starting to have fun with it and dress and do all the things. And you still teach them about discipline, the game within the game, how it's supposed to be played. I mean, it's it is a game, and it's always been it's it, baseball is America's pastime, so it's always been kind of a sacred game as well. Mm-hmm. But I think we have to um, op- they have to open their doors up and, and figure out well, how we're going to get these young fans back, like you said, and get people sit in the seats. But I only got but watching it on TV and really getting into it because yeah. um, it needs you know- to be there's a big difference between having a good time and being disrespectful. And I feel like that needs to be there. And you know, my, one of the things I noticed, Mike Trout is a generational player. He's probably right up there with the all time greats. Like we'll be in possibly argumentative top five of all time. But the fact that number one, he plays in a smaller, less known market Mm -hmm. unless they're winning. And number two, to use my brother's term, he's kind of a breadstick. He doesn't have that personality. He's what all baseball players love in the fact that, you know, he just does his job. He goes about mm-hmm. it. He's not crazy. He's a clubhouse guy. But at the same time, if he did have a little more flair and emotion, it would be nice to, you know, baseball could promote their biggest guy. I feel like mm-hmm. right now it's tough to promote Mike Trout because what does he bring? Besides, you know, he's a great player, but he doesn't have a big personality. And that hurts me to say the fact that he's a South Jersey guy. And I love the fact I'm from Jersey initially right by the shore. So mm-hmm. it hurts me to say that about him. But at the same time, he's a tough guy to put on a promotion because it's like, oh, Mike Trout. But who's he was on the subway. It's like, who's Mike Trout? Oh, he's just the best player of the last two decades. But you wouldn't yeah. know it. You wouldn't yeah. know it. So that drives me a little nuts. Yeah, like, like you know, Mike Trout's Le- Le- LeBron of baseball. You really look at it that way right now. He very easily could be, and and LeBron speaks up and speaks out and says what he, you know, he, you know, he He's says the showman on the floor. Right? It doesn't, you know, it's just everybody knows how he is, and I think you know, it's it's tough because, like you said, his personality is different. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a gamer. He's going to play the game hard, but he's not going to showboat a whole lot. He just he just plays. Yep, he loves to play the game. Um, I like to see what he would have been like in Philly. <laughs> He I know it would have been Philly great in New York, too, but I like to see what he would have liked in Philly with him and Harper on the same team. That would have been kind of cool. <laughs> he would have loved it. He's a big Phillies fan. He grew up a Phillies fan. So, yeah. you know, that would have been nice. But, you know, he took the – listen, he was loyal. He took the money, and he took yeah. loyalty. So, can't blame a guy for that. No. So, right. Steve, thank you so much for coming on. This was a great time. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you having me, and I enjoyed it, talking baseball and, you know, talk about the baseball a little bit and the, and the big league stuff because I haven't had a chance to do that a lot, but – I miss it. I enjoy what I'm doing, though. I love it. Um, it's great. Um, again, I'll let you guys know, too. Pitching Coach Pro, Gmail, um, and PitchingCoachPro.com. We're on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Um, we're everywhere, Instagram. My wife kind of takes care of all that, YouTube. So it's been great. I love doing it. Um, I just uh, I just want to keep giving back and keep coaching, and that's what I've done my whole life. So I can't imagine doing anything else. So that's always when I get to do stuff like this. I really enjoy it. Absolutely. Again, he's uh, Steve Schrank. He 
part of Major League Baseball for 16 years as a pitcher, another 16 as a coach with the Philadelphia Phillies. So if you're a younger kid, baseball guy listening to this, you want to get better as a pitcher, definitely go get in touch with him. I don't think you can get more knowledge than a guy that experienced championship runs and great teams with a great organization. Um, again, I'm Alex Cuesta. This is Sports Opinions Podcast. Find me on Twitter and Instagram at A underscore Cuesta 30. Sports Opinions on Twitter at Sports Opinion 30. Instagram, Sports Opinions 30 and the Opinions Podcast Network. Go look for us there. We have all the great shows. Um, Colton Gesser and Personal Foul Podcast, getting great guests over there. I mentioned my brother and my show and so much more. Uh, the Real OPN on Twitter, Opinions Podcast Network on Instagram. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening. Go give us a great rating and review. Steve, once again, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Have a good one, everybody.